Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for um, coming tonight. Happy St. Patty's Day. Um, and I guess it's appropriate that we're doing this presentation on St. Patty's Day because we're going to be talking about money tonight. Um, this is Understanding Financial Aid 101. Um, our presenter tonight is Moira Valenti. She is our representative from NEF, which is um, stands for the New Hampshire Higher Education Assistance Foundation. Um, for those of you that do not know what that means, um, they are a nonprofit organization um, over in Concord, and they do um, a lot of free um, college um, and financial aid programming and education um, in public schools all across New Hampshire. And they also do one-on-one um, -on -one appointments with um, New Hampshire students for financial aid um, and college, um, you know, advising and all that stuff. And we are so lucky to have Moira. She's been our representative for um, as long as I've been here, I think even a little longer. Um, and so I'm gonna hand it over to her. I will keep an eye on the chat. So any questions that you have, um, I can always stop Moira and we can answer them or we can take them at the end. So here's Moira. Perfect. So I do have a PowerPoint for you folks, but let me just give you a little bit of context before we get started. Um, tonight's presentation is really gonna focus on the financial aid award letters that students get. Um, so that is assuming that the student is a senior, they've applied to college, they've applied for financial aid. Now they're getting their information. They're looking to make a decision about college. If you have a student that is not a senior, you are more than welcome to join us for this presentation. Just know that in the fall is when I do a really detailed how to file the FAFSA and that type of thing. So you will get more instruction on that. Um, but in the meantime, for seniors and for their parents, and for those of you that will be seniors and their parents someday, we're gonna talk about the award letters that arrive from the colleges right about this time of year. All right. Amanda, are you looking at my PowerPoint? Yes. All right, we're off to a good start. So it sounds like a pretty basic question to say what is a financial aid award letter? Um, but again, let me give you a little bit of perspective that students are applying to their colleges and also applying for financial aid. First, the students are gonna hear that they've been accepted to the college and then every college that accepts them will put together a financial aid award letter for them. So those two things usually do not come together. Usually the student finds out first that they've been accepted and then a few weeks later, you find out how much it's actually going to cost you. Another piece of information that will be very helpful if you haven't figured it out already, the college communicates with the student. So even though we as parents know that we're the one paying the bill, we're the ones who are gonna keep track of some of that financial paperwork, the information is sent to the student. There are some colleges that do still send a letter home. King State, I think, still sends their financial aid award letters by mail, but it is gonna be addressed to the student. UNH and many other schools will simply send an email to your student, letting them know that their financial aid information is available in the online portal. So it may not be that you physically receive something that says this is the financial aid award package. So just really important for everybody to kind of be on the same page. If you're a senior and you found out a little while ago that you got into your colleges, but you haven't seen financial aid award packages, it's worth looking in the online portal on those colleges to see if any information has been posted to your account, because it certainly may be there. So we're gonna talk about the four things that you might see on financial aid award letters. Anytime that you see the word grant, it's free money. So you're not paying it back. A grant is free money. If the government is giving you a grant, it's gonna be called the Pell Grant. Any other grant that you see in a financial aid award package, that's money that's coming from the college itself. So what makes grant money different than scholarship money is that grant money is based on your financial need. So they have looked at your FAFSA, they have looked at all of your financial aid paperwork, they've figured out what they have to give families. And so if you're getting any money from the college itself based on your FAFSA, 
that is going to be called a grant. So it's important to remember as well that you are filing the FAFSA every year. So your financial need may go up or down. And if it does change significantly, grant money may as well. And that goes both ways. That if your family runs into financial hardship or if you have two or three students in college at the same time, you certainly may get more financial aid. Um, or again, if somebody gets promoted or there's a rise in income, there might be some of the grant money that does go away the following year, but they are assessing that grant money on a year to year basis. Scholarship, so also free money, we love scholarships. And these are based on the student's merit. So usually this has nothing to do with the FAFSA, which is why you may have already heard if your student is getting scholarship money. Sometimes what happens is a college will send the acceptance letter and say, congratulations, you're in. And you earned the Dean scholarship of $10,000 a year while you're here at school, as long as you maintain X GPA. So the reason you already know about that money is because it has nothing to do with your finances. Okay, so even if you found out about scholarship money in your acceptance letter, you're still waiting for a financial aid award package either to arrive or to be posted online um, so that you know what else you're eligible for. Okay, but anytime you see scholarship, that is based on student merit and not finances. The other great thing about scholarships is that usually those are not going to change year to year as long as you hold up your end of the bargain. So it generally will say as long as you maintain X GPA, you will get this money every year. Um, so that's a good thing that you do have kind of that guarantee as long as you're meeting that requirement. Work study is one of the confusing things sometimes on a financial aid award package just because of the way that they list it. So on a financial aid award package, you're going to find out about grants, scholarships, work study, and loans. And so financial aid is more than just the free money that the school or the government is willing to give. So anything that says grant or scholarship, absolutely, that's money coming off the bill. You may see work study on financial aid award packages as well. That's not an amount of money that's coming off the bill. So for the purposes of figuring out the expenses, I would take it out of the equation completely. So for example, if you get an award package that says your student is eligible for $2,000 in work study, what they're saying is that they've set aside a $2,000 budget. If your student wants to get a job and earn some money, they would be earning eight or $9 an hour and getting paid in a paycheck, just like any job, but the ceiling, the highest they can go is that $2,000. Um, so that is just a theoretical amount of money that they would be able to earn if they choose to get a job at the school. We do have a question about Pell Grants. Um, and the question is, do Pell Grants need to be applied for or are they awarded by the institution based upon the needs of the students? Excellent question. So filing the FAFSA actually is applying for the Pell Grant. So when you file the FAFSA, you click submit it is going to tell every student that they are eligible for the federal loans. And if the student is eligible for the Pell Grant, it will show up right there on the FAFSA. And that's because it is federal money. So it will also be on every award package from the college, but the college isn't deciding how much to give you in the Pell Grant. So if the student is getting the Pell Grant, you will see that on the FAFSA when you file it. And the Pell Grant also makes you um, students eligible for the granite guarantee in the state of New Hampshire. So if a student is Pell eligible, they will get free tuition to um, any of the New Hampshire state institutions. So Keene, Plymouth, and UNH. Um, so that's another uh, advantage to that. Absolutely. So if your student is Pell eligible, or if you think that they might be, um, you can even just Google granite guarantee to see what that means, but it's exactly what Amanda just said. Um, so you would be paying for room and board if the student were going to live on campus, but if they are eligible for the Pell Grant, they actually will get free tuition at Keene, Plymouth, or UNH. So 
So in some places you might see the loans written out as federal direct Stafford loans or just Stafford loans or just direct loans, but it's all the same thing. So loans that you're seeing in the financial aid award packages are loans from the government. So there's no co-signer and everybody qualifies for the loans. So every student who's going to be a freshman in college next year who filed the FAFSA can take out a loan from the federal government for $5,500. So that is regardless of parent income or anybody's credit or anything like that, that is an amount of money that the student can take out in their name. Where it gets confusing is the colleges sometimes break that down into two loans. They'll still equal the 5,500, but the government may subsidize up to 3,500 of that loan. If they're subsidizing it, it means that they're paying the interest while the student is in school. So when you're looking at a financial aid award package, it may say that you have a direct loan for $3,500 and a direct loan for $2,000. The 3,500 is going to be subsidized, again, meaning the government pays the interest on it until you get out of school. Any loan that is unsubsidized, interest will be accruing. So either way, you do not need to make payments until you're out of college, but you just want to be aware of what will be accruing interest and what will not. So I will leave this up just for a second. So that first line, I talked about freshman year, the maximum amount is the 5,500 and it can be break, broken down into 3,500 subsidized, 2,000 unsubsidized. Sophomore year, it goes up by $1,000. Junior year, it goes up by $1,000. And then senior year, it stays the same. So if a student is taking out loans from the federal government in their name for the four years of school, that's gonna be $27,000 that they'll graduate with in debt. Again, just in their name. And that's about $280 a month for 10 years. Um, so that is something you wanna keep in mind. Generally, students unfortunately will need more than that amount of money to go to school and to make it work. But in government loans and what they will owe, you're looking at about $280 a month. So beyond what the government will give to the student, obviously it's really easy to say you can use savings or you know, a college savings plan, cash to pay for college, but it's important to know as well that the college will let you set up a tuition payment plan. So if you owe $5,000 and you want to pay it off over the course of the year, you could set it up, it'll be a 10 month payment plan so you would be paying $500 a month for those 10 months um, to pay for that $5,000. You could even do that if you owed $20,000. If you wanted to pay off $5,000, you could take out a loan for the other $15,000. Unfortunately, student loans have fairly high interest rates once we start getting into parent loans and private loans that are out there. So for some families, it makes a lot of sense for the student to take out any government loans that they can get in their name first, and then look at whether or not it makes sense to set up a tuition payment plan, if you can afford a monthly payment, and then to take out a loan for the rest. I know this can be a very overwhelming process. I actually have two, two of my kids are in college right now as well, so I know. Um, but what happens when parents get overwhelmed, sometimes they'll say, okay, we owe the school $25,000. I'm just going to take out this loan for $25,000. When really, if the student had taken out their $5,500 in the loan and they'd set up a payment plan and taken out a loan for the rest, the amount of interest that they're paying back over time um, is going to be substantial. So it's just something that you want to look at. If you are talking about loans, you essentially have two options as a parent. You can take out a PLUS loan, which is a government loan. PLUS stands for Parent Loan for Undergraduate Student. The parent takes out the loan. It does stay in the parent's name for the life of the loan. So that is one of the things that does make it a little bit different. Everybody gets the same interest rate for the PLUS loan. 
So if you get approved, you can take out whatever you need to pay the bill at the college and you're gonna get the same interest rate as everybody else. The other way to go is with a private loan. And then we're talking banks, credit unions, um, Sally May. So there are nonprofit agencies and there are for-profit agencies that do private student loans. In that case, it is the student taking it out and they do need a credit worthy co-signer. So that doesn't have to be mom or dad, but it has to be somebody with good credit and an income that is going to co-sign with them. And when you're looking at private loans, you are comparing them. They all get to kind of make up their own rules. So many of them may have a co-signer release after a couple of years of on-time payment. Um, some might be a fixed rate, some might be a variable rate. So really you can apply for a few and take the best deal. That is absolutely something you can do. You can shop around. If you're doing that in June, you know, May, June, July, that's when people are usually applying for the loans. If you apply to several loans, but do it within a two week period, it only counts as one credit pull. So even if it's seven companies that are pulling your credit, that it only counts as one because they know you're only gonna take out the one student loan to send your child to college. So here are some of the major differences between the PLUS loan, which again is the government loan, and the private student loans that are out there. So it's going to tell you whose name it's in. So again, the PLUS loan, even if you consolidate them later, refinance them, it's going to be in the parent's name. So you just wanna keep that in mind. The federal loan also does have an origination fee, which most private loans do not. Um, the interest rate right now is 5.3%, and the interest rates on private loans are going to vary based on your credit, based on the market, that type of thing. So you will apply for the loan, then they will tell you what your interest rate will be. Um, and you can look into whether you want to fix your variable interest rate, um, whether you want to make full payments starting right away, or you can make interest-only payments or defer payments. You want to look at some of those things as well when you're choosing which company or which loan to take out. And we did have another question um, about the PLUS loan. Um, the question is, is the FAFSA um, the application for the PLUS loan um, or is that a separate application? And I believe the answer is yes, that the, the parent PLUS loan is a separate application that you have to apply for. It is not included when you do the FAFSA. Correct. You are going to use all the FAFSA information, though. It's on the same website. So everything now is on studentaid.gov. And it will tell you on there. Click here if you want to apply for a PLUS loan. You as a parent had a username and password in order to file the FAFSA. That's the username and password you're going to use to create your application for the PLUS loan. So it's going to look very similar. You're going to be on the same website. But it is a separate application process. Excellent question. They are all connected, so it's really hard to kind of keep things together sometimes. If a parent applies for the PLUS loan and gets denied, there are two options. They can essentially either find somebody with better credit that's willing to co-sign the loan with them, or the student has the option of taking out an additional $4,000 loan from the government. So, Usually for the PLUS loan, they're looking back a couple of years in your credit. Um, if you don't have any late payments, things like that, usually they can be pretty lenient. But, you know, with everything going on right now, certainly some people don't have great credit. And so you might get denied. If that happens, again, you can get a co-signer. They call it an endorser. Or the student can get $4,000 in a loan they would call the college and say, my mom or dad got denied for the PLUS loan, so I would like the additional $4,000 loan. So that can be very helpful at piecing together the cost of the college, but if you need 30,000, you get denied, and now your student can take out 4,000. Obviously, that doesn't help you get to where you need to be. Um, but I do want you to know that if for some reason a parent gets denied for the PLUS loan, that there are a couple of options out there. And it is easier to get approved for the PLUS loan 
than it is to get approved as a cosigner on a private loan. Um, so if you do get denied for the PLUS loan, you may have a hard time co-signing a private loan. Um, so that's just something that you want to keep in mind as well, depending on what your credit looks like. Here are some of the general questions that we get. Do I have to pay my admission deposit before I return my award? You do not. Nothing is locking you into going to that school until you send the deposit. And for most colleges, May 1st is that date. With the pandemic, many places have extended that, but there are very few places that tell you you have to make that decision before May 1st. So almost everywhere you have until May 1st to actually put down your deposit to save your spot in next year's class. When will I receive a bill from the college? So when you get the financial aid award letter, that's when you're going to know about how much it's gonna cost you to go to that school. You'll decide what school you're going to go to. You'll put down a deposit by May 1st. So usually it's June or July when the colleges send out their bills. What can I expect in terms of financial aid in future years? So again, you will file the FAFSA every year. So if you do have any grant money, that may go up or down slightly, depending on if your finances change. If you were awarded scholarship money from the college, you will get to keep that as long as you meet whatever parameters they have set up around it. Um, so some schools that might be a 2.8 GPA, other schools that might be a 3.2 GPA. Just make sure you know what that requirement is because they absolutely will expect you to meet that requirement in order to get the scholarship every year. Can I borrow for more than the direct cost of the school? You can. So I said earlier that if you take out the PLUS loan, they'll loan you what you need to pay the bill. And I mean that if you need $20,000 to pay the bill, they're not going to say, oh, you're only approved for $5,000. You can take out the 20,000 to pay the bill. If you need a little bit more to pay for books, other expenses, travel costs, they usually build in a cushion of a couple thousand dollars that you are allowed to take out above what you owe the school itself. So that if the student does need to buy books and you don't have that cash on hand, you can borrow for that as well. This question always comes up for us um, when we're doing these presentations in person. There is always somebody who says, what about negotiating? Um, what I will tell you about that is that absolutely it doesn't hurt to ask. I'm definitely of that school of thought. My piece of advice though is don't ever use the word negotiate. Um, when they're putting together these financial aid award packages, they really do want your student to come to that school they are giving you the best offer that they can. They do not go into this looking at it as it's going to be a negotiation. Um, so generally, again, it doesn't hurt to ask, but schools aren't usually going to say, oh, here's another $10,000. So if you are not happy with your financial aid award, if you think the school might be able to do a little bit more, first, it's gonna mean a lot more coming from the student. For the student to be the one saying, I really want to go to this school. My parents and I are trying to figure out how to make this work. So again, it will mean more coming from the student. And that might mean that they come up with another $1,000 grant or $500 in a work study job or something like that, which again, if you didn't ask, you wouldn't have gotten that $1,000. But if it's a difference between school A and school B and one school gave you $10,000 a year more in financial aid, it doesn't mean that they're going to meet you there. Um, so just realize that your financial aid package is probably pretty close um, to finalized. So you can certainly ask for more, but you're not going to see a huge shift. If I receive private scholarships, how does that affect my financial aid? I know Amanda is going to talk about local scholarships. You do live in a very generous community. There's absolutely money out there. So students, everybody has heard a horror story about some college that took away some of the financial aid because a student got an outside scholarship. 
that almost never happens. If you are concerned that it might happen, your question to the school is, how do you treat outside scholarships? Okay, but unless the student already has received enough in scholarships and grants to pay the entire bill, usually getting an outside scholarship isn't going to affect any financial aid that they got. Um, but if you want to make sure, you would be asking the college, how do you treat outside scholarships? All right, so the presentation itself is kind of short and sweet. Um, but Amanda, we certainly can talk about scholarships or I can answer any other questions. Um, we did get one more question, so let's do that first and then I'll talk about the, the local scholarships. Um, the first line on one of the slides talked about savings and 523 plan. So I guess they're wanting to know more about that. Oh, okay. So a 529 college savings plan is a way that some people save for college. So you are putting the money away it's after tax, but then any money that grows in that account, in the investment account, is not going to be taxed as, you, as long as it's used to pay for college. Um, so there are some parents who set up 529 plans when their kids were little, or maybe grandma has a 529 plan for the student, um, but that is one of the college saving plans that's out there in New Hampshire. Fidelity is the one who holds all of the 529 plans. Okay. Um, all right, so scholarships. So we are in the midst of scholarship season. Um, every senior should have gotten an email from Mrs. Estes. Um, those of you who don't know Mrs. Estes, she used to be the registrar and secretary up here in the counseling center. She is now um, Mr. Dustin's secretary, but she is still overseeing the scholarship process just because she's done it for the past few years. Um, and she's also, you know, Mrs. Marmondo is also going to be working with her on that as well. Um, so everyone should have gotten an email with the packet for that. And when I say packet, I mean the instructions. Um, it's not every single application sent in email. Um, so the process is outlined in that email. Um, all of the applications can be found on your student's um, Navient account. So um, your student, if they have applied to colleges, they should um, know how to log into their Navient account. If they do not, of course, they can um, you know, come and see me and I can help with that. Um, the other thing is that I'm going to be running two scholarship boot camps. Um, the first is going to be tomorrow after school in person. I don't have a room yet, but I'm thinking it's going to be um, in either Miss Senora McCarthy's room or Miss Oshiak's room. Um, I just need to make sure I have enough space for everyone to, you know, six feet and all that. Um, so the, and the second one is going to be next Wednesday, and that's after school in person at 2.15. Um, the next one is going to be next Wednesday, a week from today, March 24th um, at 1130. And that is via Zoom online. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I, the virtual one really is more for the seniors who are remote. I would much rather do a scholarship boot camp um, with most of seniors in person because it's just a lot easier to run it than having like 15 kids on Zoom. Um, of course, I completely understand that seniors, you know, you guys have your, your jobs and your sports and all that stuff. Um, so if your preference would be to do it via Zoom, that's fine. I'm going to be sending out the link next week so that you can all come to that. The um, benefits of going to the boot camp is that I go over the process with you. I answer your questions. I give you some tips and tricks. Um, and it's just a really good time to really kind of solidify out and kind of calm those jitters because it is a very tedious um, and stressful process. And there's a lot of scholarships, like Mara said, we have a very generous community. Um, this is gonna shock all of you guys, but your class, the senior class is now 57 kids. That's it, 57 kids, which means that your, your class has much better chances of getting these scholarships than probably a lot of classes in the past count. Um, and of course, not all of your um, classmates are applying to colleges. So you guys have really good chances of getting at least one of these scholarships, but you have to apply.
apply for them. Okay, I can't stress that enough. You are not going to get awarded a scholarship unless you apply. So come to the boot camp. Um, if you can't make either of those boot camps, you can certainly, um, you know, if there's enough need for it, I can always do a second one. I am in the midst of the scheduling too, so it's a little crazy, but I will definitely make time for you if it's needed. Um, and so that's just my that's my my um, speech about that. <laughs> um, the other thing is to pay attention to your email. You know, I'm a broken record with this. I just sent you guys out an email yesterday um, with a whole bunch of updates and things like that. Um, but the other scholarships that we get that are more like state and local, um, not so much like the local scholarships that are just for Conan seniors, those are all coming from Mrs. Mormondo. So she is, whenever we get those scholarships, she emails them out to you. She also has a lovely little wall of um, packets here. So if you're looking for something tangible, if you're, you're not sure if you've got something in your email, come to the counseling center. She has them all up um, on the wall and she keeps them. She loves like flagging down seniors and being like, did you see this scholarship? So definitely you can email her, you know, oh, Mrs. Mormondo, are there any new scholarships? She will definitely, um, you know, talk to you about that and send anything to you. Um, but the emails that you want to keep an eye on, aside from your teachers, are from me, Mrs. Mormondo, and Mrs. Estes. If you're not sure, search for our names and any emails from us will come up. Um, so that is my speech for now. Does anyone have any other questions? I think that's it. Uh, it looked like one more came in, Amanda, and it looked very specific to- Oh, sorry. Your SAU. So Does our SAU offer the ability for auto deduct from a school employee pay? I do not know the answer to that question. To be 100% honest, our SAU offer the ability to auto deduct from a school employee pay into a 529. I am going to take that question down and I am um, going to ask probably our HR director, I guess. I don't know. So, um, okay. Auto. And the other question that just came in, um, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, folks. So, thank you for asking that question. If you have financial aid packages and you would like to sit down with me virtually, unfortunately, I'm only allowed to do virtually for the next few months, um, but I'm more than happy to sit down on a Zoom call like this with you and your family, and we can go through the financial aid packages and talk about things like that. I am more than happy to review those and help explain them. Sometimes they're not always clear, and unfortunately, they don't all use the same language in describing things. Okay, so I wrote down that question. Um... Let's see, is the boot camp tomorrow after school Thursday? Yes. So the in person boot camp is tomorrow, Thursday, March 18th at 2 15 after school. Um, like I said, I don't know the exact location, but um, they can, if students want to come and check with um, us tomorrow, um, we can direct them to the right place or we can let the men, senior mentors know where it's going to be tomorrow. So, yeah. Um, David. Um, can you put your email or, or email me? Um, so that way I know where to send the answer to when I, when I get this answer for that question about the 529. Ah, okay. I was wondering. <laughs> I will certainly do that. Um, if there are not any other questions, you guys are all free to go unless you have any other questions. If anything else comes up, um, you can um, call me or email me.